animals make an awful lot of noise. <laughs> Birds sing, dogs bark, lions roar, shrimp are among the noisiest, and even fish you sound to communicate. There is so much animal noise around that we can't help asking what it's all for. Clearly it's a form of communication. All animals communicate. But what does it mean? Does it mean anything other than I'm here, come and mate with me, or this is my territory, stay away. Is it a language? Now, scientists generally agree that animals don't have a language per se, but there's much less agreement on what a language actually is and how it's different from just communication. And when we ask, do animals have a language, we have to be very careful that we're not really asking do animals have a language like human language, you know, with words and sentences? That would be a much easier question to answer because very, very few species communicate using words like we do. And it wouldn't get to the heart of the question, which is how much do animals say to each other? Because it's generally thought that the main characteristic of a true language is that it should be infinitely extensible. There's no end to the number of books that will ever be written or the number of original ideas that you can express. Some linguists and philosophers think that the only way to make a true language is to have, like us, a small vocabulary of words and then to use a grammar to combine those words in infinitely different ways. Human language is, rather obviously, made of nouns and verbs and words and sentences. And we conclude that a grammar is necessary for language so that the words can be given endless possible meanings. But animals communicate without using discrete words. Is it possible that animal language is so fundamentally different from ours that we wouldn't even recognize it as a language? Do we really believe that every civilization throughout the galaxy uses words just like we do? The universe is a big place. Can we really be confident that conclusions we draw just based on our language are so universally applicable? Well, we see from animals that there may well be other ways to build a language. Even if the animals don't use that as a language themselves, we can still look to them for clues about the mechanisms that may be important on other planets. Because when we search for extraterrestrial intelligence, how are we going to decode an alien radio signal if we don't know what it might contain? We don't know what aliens speak like. Are there any conclusions at all that we can draw? In fact, there's a lot that we can say about alien language. All animal communication on Earth, the way that your dog looks at you with big eyes and wags his tail, tells us things not just about animals on Earth, but about animals everywhere in the universe. And that's because we share something very, very fundamental with all life on Earth, the creatures that speak and the creatures that don't speak, as well as with every alien species throughout the universe. All life on Earth and on every inhabited planet evolved through natural selection. It's the only mechanism we know that can create creatures with this kind of complexity out of simple beginnings. Even if the planets on which they live are completely different, frozen worlds like Saturn's moons, Enceladus has oceans trapped under kilometers of ice, or Titan with seas of liquid methane, natural selection is the common heritage of all life in the universe. And that means that the rules of natural selection apply everywhere. Rules like every new behavior evolves gradually, with each step giving a distinct advantage over the step before. 
Everything evolves one small step at a time, one small improvement after another. Natural selection has no foresight. No one says, oh, let's evolve a language. That would be good. Rather, every trait we observe, language included, holds within it the legacy of its evolutionary past, those steps that led it to be as it is today. So we can always ask, what is it that gives a particular way of communicating some small advantage? Here's an example. Why do some birds tweet and other birds warble? This is something we can investigate right here on Earth, and the answer is very, very revealing. But first, when we study animal vocalizations, we often use a visual representation of the sound. It's called a spectrogram. You can think of it as being similar to musical notation. Here you can see how the pitch of the sound goes up and down and flat and up and down and flat. And here are the songs of two birds, a junco and a white-crowned sparrow. So the junco tweets, the sparrow warbles. Why? Well, it turns out that birds tweet if they evolved in forests, where the dense trees and the leaves means that the sound doesn't penetrate very far. Tweets are particularly immune to that kind of distortion. Whereas birds that evolved in grasslands warble, because warbling's more efficient than tweeting, and in the open country, people can hear your songs perfectly well. The physical and the ecological constraints determine the kind of communication that an animal will use. The way that the ecology determines communication can be very striking. I realized this a, a few years ago when I was studying the behavior of wild wolves, and at the same time, I happened independently to be interested in dolphin whistles. And what you can see is that the spectrogram of a wolf howl is remarkably similar to the spectrogram of a dolphin whistle. Of course, the whistle's a lot shorter. It's less than half a second instead of five seconds, and the pitch is much higher. But the basic shape is the same. And when I slow down that dolphin whistle about 20 times, it does sound remarkably like a wolf howl. Now, there's nothing mystical about this connection between dolphins and wolves, it's actually quite expected, because both species occupy very similar ecological niches. They're both highly intelligent, they're both cooperative hunters, and they both need to stay in contact with members of their group over distances where the sound becomes faint and distorted. And the best way to do that is to howl or to whistle. Imagine you and a friend standing on two hills across a wide valley. If you tried shouting to each other, you might hear the sound, but you wouldn't understand what each other was saying. That's because human speech is much more like warbling than tweeting. Now, if you really wanted to communicate, you might try yodeling. <laughs> It's no coincidence that yodeling and wolf howling and dolphin whistling share certain acoustic characteristics. In particular, the important information is contained in the way that the pitch varies up and down. So the physical constraints of the problem that the animal is trying to overcome, communicating over long distances, dictates the kinds of solutions that will work well. And since the laws of physics are the same all over the universe, the same solutions work well everywhere. And we can expect that the alien equivalent of dolphins or wolves will howl or whistle or possibly yodel. <laughs> but neither dolphins nor wolves use words. As far as we can tell, each howl and whistle is a self-contained communicative signal.
But because animal researchers, myself included, have tended to focus solely on this word sentence paradigm for language, we haven't really investigated the different ways that animals might be putting information into their signals. Maybe like varying the pitch slightly. It's probably quite premature to declare animals don't have a language because they don't communicate many different concepts when we've barely scratched the surface of the ways that they communicate. For example, here are a series of whistles from a single dolphin. They look very similar. Similar, but not exactly the same. Is that because they mean slightly different things? Or is it just random variation, just like no two words that we say ever sound exactly the same? We don't know the answer to that yet. But we have to broaden our search for where information might be in communication if we ever want to understand what creatures from another planet say to us. And animals can help us with that search. Because all of the social and communicative behavior that your dog shows evolved because of evolutionary pressures that presumably also exist on other planets. Now, thinking about the physical constraints on communication also tells us some interesting things about some kinds of communication that don't occur very often on Earth. All life that we know of works on electricity. Every cell in our body is powered by the flow of electrically charged ions in and out. And with all that electrical machinery inside of us, it's kind of surprising that we don't use electricity to communicate. But some animals do. Two groups of fishes, one in Africa and one in South America, send clear messages to members of their species by varying the electrical field around their bodies. It's the closest thing we know to telepathy. Now, electric field communication has a lot of advantages. You can put a lot of information into a signal very reliably. And it doesn't depend on a clear line of sight like a visual signal would. And it's no surprise that these fishes live in very murky rivers where the visibility is very low. And unless your predators have evolved ways to detect this, they can't hear what you're saying. But electrical signals use an awful lot of energy. And the physical adaptations within the fish's body to produce and detect these signals are absolutely overwhelming. So it seems that when you consider the cost-benefit trade-off on Earth, electric communication just hasn't been that worthwhile. On other planets, it may be different. Maybe where there's no light at all, maybe where sound doesn't travel so well. But at least we have the opportunity to study these outlandish ways of communicating here on Earth, even if the planets where they're in common use probably will always be hidden to us. And here's the thing. Life on Earth has evolved a dizzying array of ways to communicate. Some of them have become very widespread and diverse, and others have remained very specific and very niche. Rabbits thump their feet to warn of danger, but they don't say very much else. Kangaroo rats, on the other hand, drum their feet to send out complex messages that tell about their individual identity and their social status. Each species takes a particular way of communicating and adapts it for their own survival needs, but no further. One of those ways of communicating, the one that used words and sentences, evolved into the language we're using now. But rather than being the pinnacle of evolution, we're just one branch on a very tangled bush of possibilities. There's no reason, as far as we can see, that our language is any more inevitable than kangaroo rat drumming language or electric fish telepathic language. So think about that when you go for a walk in the woods and you hear the birds singing. There could be a planet 
where it's birdsong that's evolved into language, where all the Shakespeare and the Aristotle is sung in trills and chirps instead of words and sentences. And pay close attention to your dog and what he says to you and why, because that can be telling you a lot more about alien communication than you think. Thank you.